Hey there. Hi, ever. Welcome. Welcome to the Sunday Knit Tea Live. Um, sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. It has been a weekend. <laughs> It has been, it has been a weekend. It has been a rough weekend. I'm going to be honest. I will share all about it with you guys, but hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we don't have any major technical problems during the next hour. That's, that's the hope. So, oh, let's see. We got three people on joining us. I'm going to ignore that error. I think that's incorrect. Um, let me know, say hi in the chat box so I know that you're here and I can say a special personalized hello to you. I hope that you're having a good Sunday. I have my coffee, as always. When I first dreamed up doing these Knit Tea Lives, I thought, oh, I'll bring Bloody Marys or mimosas to, to the Knit Tea Live. And no, it's always coffee. <laughs> it's always coffee. Hi, Samantha. Welcome. Welcome. I hope, like I said, I hope you all are having a great weekend. Um, yeah, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you that I was going to try to do, again, try to do a kind of pattern spotlight. These are things that I saw. Maybe I will try it. We will see. But hey, Whitney, I hope your coffee is as good as mine. I have really good coffee. I'm so fortunate. I'm so fortunate that my husband loves making coffee and he he gets he's very particular about the whole process. The beans, getting the temperature to the correct water, the timing of everything. I mean it is like our kitchen it almost feels like a lab. Um as always, let me just do this real quick. As always, make sure or if my audio goes wonky or bad, please let me know because I can't hear how this sounds to you. Um, I can just see what my monitor is telling me, but that doesn't always tell me the whole story. And yeah, and let me just see something real quick as we wait for some desktops. Maybe I'll, oh, no, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think... Uh, Pattern spotlight's gonna happen this week. I just couldn't get my stuff together in time. So, um, but, but there were new pattern releases that are on Fiber Happenings. Um, there are a couple of fingerless mitt project or fingerless glove projects in Fiber Happenings. And I think I love, obviously, I love knitting fingerless gloves. So um, there's that. There is a, fun a fundraiser from Kathleen Sperling of Whip Insanity. She's doing a fundraiser this month for uh, Lebanese Red Cross. So because of the horrible explosion that happened there. So she is, she has her blanket arabesque. Her arabesque blanket is pay what you want fundraiser. So yeah, if, if you have a chance after today, if you haven't already, go and check out Fiber Happenings to see everything that is happening there. <laughs> That's at knitswhereitsat.com. And Fiber Happenings is updated every Monday and Friday. So um, yes, I will be updating it tomorrow. So you'll want to check that out as well. The Monday update tends to be an update on just deals and specials that are going on around the webs, the webs, the interwebs. Um, so that's always good to check out. Uh, speaking of, speaking of deals, I have not tweeted about this, but I, I, I went to go grab my phone, but my phone is in front of me as my camera right now. Um, speaking of deals, lovecrafts.com, uh, hashtag affiliate link in the description box, but they are having a huge sale on their warehouse that's going on until the end of the day tomorrow. So if you're interested in stocking up on any yarn or supplies or, you know, anything at all, check out lovecrafts.com. Yes, I am an affiliate with Lovecraft, so I do earn a small commission if you use my link and purchase something. But, you know, that's only if you want to buy something. Don't buy something just for me. Just if you're going to buy something anyway, you can help my channel out at the same time. Um, 
But also, if you do go to Lovecrafts, I have my own, I'm a member there, obviously, because I'm an affiliate, and <laughs> I have a page, and on the page, you can find listings for all the designers who are on the Fiber Indie list who sell through Lovecrafts. I have them all on, a on my members page favorited, and I have some of their projects favorited as well. So if you go to lovecrafts.com, uh, you can check out my community page and see who is on the Fiber Indie list, who has patterns on sale there. And I have the same thing going on with Etsy as well, where I also am an affiliate. I know, look, right now I feel like the biggest hack with all, I'm an affiliate, affiliate code, affiliate code, ah, but you know, I have a hard drive I need to pay for. And we will get into that next. Uh, hey, Bear. Welcome. So glad to see you. So let me tell you about my weekend. Um, this is going to go not totally knitting related, but knitting related. It's definitely channel related. You may have noticed I did not have a new upload on Friday or Saturday or today. And that is because I had a major technological fail <laughs> this weekend. Um, oh my gosh, I can't even, whew. Ah. So what happened is basically the hard drive that my video that I was working on that I was going to put up this weekend failed. Um, it didn't, it's, I don't, well, it might be physically damaged, but it's not physically damaged to the point where I can't get anything off the hard drive, but there is definitely, at the very least, a corrupted file. And hey, Claudia, welcome. So glad you can make it. Thank you. Um, so yes, on Friday, I was going in, or I already knew, Thursday night I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get the video up on Friday, but I was like, that's okay, I'll just get it up on Saturday morning, no big deal. Sat down Friday morning, and I went to work on my video, the edit, and finish it so I could get it up maybe even by the end of the day. Who knew? I was going to press my luck. Couldn't open the file. Could not open the file. I spent hours, I updated my operating system, I did all this stuff trying to, it just wasn't gonna open. Was not gonna open. Yesterday, I was kind of praying, hoping, you know, like you do, like maybe if I just walk away, something, a little fairy will fly down and sprinkle some fairy dust over the hard drive. I'll come back to it the next day and it'll be fine. I can at least copy the file um, off of the hard drive onto another hard drive that I normally use just for outputting videos and I can finish the video and it'll be fine. No, 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 the techno gods, the new American God techno gods did not float down from, you know, the ether and fix my hard drive. They failed me. Um, they failed me hard. And so that hard drive, it's not dead. I can get, I've been able to copy some things off of it to get some of it backed up, but not the video that I was working on this weekend. So I had to order a new hard drive. <laughs> it's not, at least it was on sale at Costco, uh, not affiliated. But uh, yeah, so the hard drive failed. I'm going to have to restart the edit on that video. And that's the upshot of that. So that was disappointing, but these things happen. That's life. You know, I'm a one woman show, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was disappointing. It's disappointing to say the least. Um, but you know, if that's all that had happened this weekend, it'd been fine, it'd been fine, but no. Um, I don't know if, if you follow me on Instagram, if you follow me on Twitter, you know, I sprained my ankle yesterday as well. <laughs> yes, uh, if I seem a little tense, that's because I'm in a, wee bit of pain right now. Um, yeah, we went swimming. I have a pool. I love my pool. And, or as my daughter likes to say, I love the pool. That's how she says it. It's so cute. I love the pool. Um, we went swimming. When we came in, some water dripped on the floor. I thought I dried it all up. No, nope, missed, missed a drop of water. Stepped on it. Sprained my ankle. Um, <laughs> it was one of those moments of like, oh. Uh, me spraining my ankle is a 
fairly regular occurrence in my life. I have very weak ankles. Um, I've been spraining my ankles since I was a kid. Um, I have severely sprained both of my ankles on multiple occasions. And so as soon as it happened, I knew, I knew as soon as I was going down on the floor screaming, I was like, God damn it, damn it. I sprained my ankle again. It's been three years since I sprained my ankle. And yeah, so that was really, really disappointing. That's what, actually part of the reason I was a little late getting started this morning is because I was hobbling around getting everything set up. But I'm here and the, you know, the thing is about spraining your ankle is it does not interfere with knitting. So Bear, maybe it was the universe's way to get you have open hands for a better one that will work for all things you are working on. Still a bummer though. Yes, that is a very positive spin to put on it, Bear. And I don't think you are incorrect. I think that I did need a bigger hard drive. Um, and I was getting to a point where I was going to need a new hard drive. So this was definitely the universe going, uh, Carrie, you need to do this. It's okay. You're gonna make it. Just, it, just get the hard drive. So, um, that is a very positive way of putting it. And, but I think the biggest bummer, I mean, besides, did I put my pants on inside out? <laughs> um, uh, so my pants right now are on inside out. That's funny. Anyway, it's fine. I mean, they were the same. They're not on backwards at least. And I just shared that with all of y'all. That's a good, that's my weekend. That is my weekend. Anyway, um, yeah, but at least with the sprained ankle, I could still knit. So that's what I'm going to do first. Well, after I told you this whole long story about the catastrophic weekend I've been having. 2020, man. 2020 is the evil fairy that won't stop giving Anyway, um, I'm going to show you what's on my needles because I did get quite a bit of knitting done uh, the last couple of days. So let me get this. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. I know last week there were issues with shadows, but I think I have the lighting set up. So hopefully there's not bad flickering. If there is, please let me know and I will try to do something. I think some of that flickering from last weekend is caused uh, let me just i gotta zoom out my camera a little bit okay so let's do this oops all right so first up i'm going to i've made progress on this oh let me get that on this here we go um this scarf I've been working on for a while now. It's It really should be finished by now, but the fact is that I have just been, you know, a lot of stuff goes on. And projects that shouldn't take that long take me longer because I always have more than enough on my plate. But this is where it's at. I finished this panel here, right here of this trellis and believe it or not this pattern is just knit and pearl combination and what's cool about it is you have this trellis pattern through here that almost looks like cabling but you turn it over and you have this really hey look here's where i joined yarn in the middle you have this really cool diamond pattern on the reverse side. So this is the kind of knit pearl combination that can be reversible where you get two different effects depending on which side you want to be the public side of the work. And what I originally I was going to just do one long scarf where it was this here is the beginning of it that has just a little bit of eyelet work. Um, just a little bit to give it a little bit of fun texture for this section and then I was going to work the rest of the scarf um, the body of the scarf in this pattern here and then end it with this again but I was part of a really interesting conversation on Twitter this weekend or this week I had a few good conversations on Twitter this week but one of them was about good patterns 
for beginning knitters and I always kind of designed this with beginners in mind and people kept talking about how scarves just take too long for new knitters and beginning knitters and someone was like you know cows make a better choice and I was like you know what I think there's some wisdom to that and um I was like, I think there's some wisdom to that, that maybe doing a scarf can feel too long and maybe a cow would be better. And I was like, you know what? If I do this as a cow, I can knit this straight, seam the ends together, and then a new knitter can start getting comfortable with, with seams. But my other thought was I can create panels here. So um, now my thought process is, and you can see that I've started doing this, I have this panel here of the diamonds, and then I'm redoing a new section of that bottom garter and eyelet, right? And so I'm gonna do a complete repeat of that that I did at the beginning. And then I'm going to go back to this panel, but for the second panel, I'm going to have this diamond pattern on the front side. And I think, we'll see how many panels I do. I mean, I need to do at least three. So maybe it'll be two trellis in one diamond, or maybe I'll do four where it's two, di two trellis and two diamonds and each panel like this is separated by this section here. So what do you think? Do you think that sounds like a cool idea? I think so. <laughs> I've already started it, but there, that sounds really cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm making progress on this. Maybe by the end of the year, I'll actually have it finished. Maybe. Oops, sorry. My yarn got caught up in a cable. Oh, modern knit life. <laughs> Tangles all the time. The other thing I've been working on for a while, which a lot of you have seen the beginning of, is this tunic pattern. I finished the front half. And I started the back half and I finally finished the garter border right here. So this is all garter right here. And now I've gotten up to what is the exciting part of this pattern. The front of the tunic is a V-neck with very long armholes because the tunic is really kind of a swim cover-up, but it's all stockinette on the front. And then the back is where I wanted to have some interest. So let me tilt my camera down a little bit more. There we go. And I'm going to open this up. Oh, oh no, zoom in a little bit. And so this is what I'm doing on the back. It's the center panel that's going to run all the way up the center. And then what I'm going to do is when it's time to go off to the armholes, um, I'll complete this motif here, but I'm going to continue this, this cabling motif here. I'll move that up a little bit. Is that better? this here up across the arm straps because this is a it's a sleeveless swim cover up tunic so that's what I'm doing I'm very excited this pattern here let me tilt my camera oops there that's better so you can really see it better Samantha what size yarn are you using for the tunic this is actually a worsted weighted yarn this is the yarn um this is a discontinued yarn, sadly, I might add. Um, this is called the, it was, uh, it's now owned by Webbs. I don't have the ball band in front of me, but I do have my notebook. Wait, I got my notebook. Just, I gotta reach under here. Ah. But it's, a, it's actually worsted weighted yarn, but I'm working it on size six, size four needles size five needles. I'm working it on size five needles because this yarn is a viscous linen um, silk blend. So it's a slippier yarn. It's a plant-based yarn. And for those type of yarns, I like to work on a smaller needle so that I get a tighter gauge so that as this, because it's going to stretch, that's what plant-based fibers will do. Um, is they'll start to stretch out and knitting this at a tighter gauge kind of helps control that that spread that starts to happen. Uh, you can see all my crazy notes. Loop de loop quartz. That's what it is. This yarn is called loop de loop quartz. It's 54% viscous, 23% linen, 20% silk, 3% metallic. It's a really pretty 
yarn. I wish it wasn't discontinued, but I have a ton of it. Um, <laughs> so I'm always like, what can I make with it? Um, put that back there. Arr. In fact, this back here that's always in the background, that's the same yarn, this project here. That's broomstick lace, by the way, which is a crochet technique. Um, I made that through a craftsy class. So, yeah. But I'm very excited about this stitch pattern. I think it's just so pretty. This, um, this stitch pattern is a twisted, basically it's a twisted cabling technique, somewhat similar to um, Bavarian twist stitch patterns, if you know anything about that. Um, this pattern, this stitch pattern here, comes from this book, which is the, oh, look, hello. Let me zoom out my camera a little bit. The Japanese Knitting Stitch Bible. Um, oh my God, this book is, this book is amazing, but I will say the stitch patterns in it are next level. Let's just say that. These are like level up type stitch patterns, but they, I mean, they're gorgeous. It, they're gorgeous, but it's, it is definitely, um, a little bit more challenging, which is good, which is good for me. I enjoy that. But the pattern I'm doing this here is the pattern that I'm doing. So you can see. Now, obviously what I'm doing is going to look different because this sample was done in a wool yarn. So, um, it's going to look different than how, than what I, the stop, thank you, use your words. <laughs> the stitch pattern is going to obviously look a little bit different when it's done in a plant-based fiber. And that just has to do with the different characteristics of cellulose-based fibers versus wool-based fibers. But yeah, and I mean, it's gorgeous. This whole book, I mean, it's just like, um, I'm definitely somebody who loves having stitch dictionaries and stitch pattern Bibles. And I love just looking at them and seeing like the pretty patterns. And the, I love these twisted stitch cabling patterns because the cabling is usually you are just, do I have it here with me? Oh, it's over there. Um, I don't know what I'm saying right now. I'm kind of babbling a little bit. Sorry, I'm babbling right now, but I am so in love with this book. So if you're all familiar with Bavarian twist stitch patterns or just twist stitch cable patterns at all, it's really cool because it is a cabling technique, but you are generally only cabling one or two stitches. So you're only crossing like two stitches at a time or four stitches at a time. So it's much easier to do the cabling without having to use a cable needle. And the other thing is you get these really cool textures because you're using twist stitches. You're able, these are designed to do twist stitches. So these, that's in here, you can see it better maybe in this one. That's another really pretty one. But yeah, so I hope I'm not babbling too much. Here's this book that I was gonna grab. This is um, Twisted Stitch Knitting. This is a classic, I gotta zoom out again. There we go. This is from the Bavarian region, these stitch patterns. And um, yeah, so pretty, so, so pretty. And it's just, to me, this sort of cabling work is just very approachable. If you haven't done cabling before, because you're only, like I said, you're only crossing two stitches generally at a time. Maybe you're doing a two by two where you have, you know, four stitches and you're crossing two of them like that. But it's just very easy. Bears, wow, you are so talented. I appreciate getting to learn from you, sharing what you know. Oh, thank you, Bear. That is so sweet. That's so sweet. So. That's what's on my needles right now. Well, I mean, that's not everything that's on my needles. 
that's not everything that's on my needles right now, but that is definitely the two big projects that I'm working on right now. And I feel good. I feel like I've made some good progress here um, on these. Like I always say, I'm not the most prolific knitter in terms of quantity of work. Like, because I'm just, it's interesting. I'm not a slow knitter. If you want, if I'm, if I'm not knitting on camera, I'm a fairly fast knitter, which is ironic because I'm always like, don't worry about how many stitches per second you're doing or how many stitches per minute. It doesn't matter. Just knit at your own speed. But I am, I think, I feel like my own, my own evaluation of my own knitting, I think I'm a relatively, I'm so fidgety. I'm a relatively quick knitter, but I'm not a fast knitter in the sense of completing projects. <laughs> normally because I have like three or four different projects going at once and I'll work on something and then I'll kind of put it to the side and get caught up in some other project and then come back to the larger project again so and then when I do finish I I can take a really long time to weave ends like this hat my birthday is in December I started and finished this hat in December did I weave in my oh I finally weaved in my ends this past month. So this was just sitting, this hat sitting, waiting to have the ends woven in so I could call it finished. I still need to wash it, but um, yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> it's still not finished because I still gotta wash it. <laughs> but it's a really cute hat. See, I'll put it on. It's just like a little very shallow tan, anyway. Um, I made this pattern up as I went. You can, I call this my gaugeless hat because I didn't need a gauge. I just, you can with hats if you want. If you feel like I don't want to, I don't want to knit a gauge swatch. <laughs> I want to throw caution to the wind, but I still want something that I think will fit. You can always start a hat from the center out. In most hat patterns, you start at the brim, work up, and then do the crown but you don't have to do it that way. You can start at the center out and knit outwards until you have the crown of the hat as wide as you want. This works really well with Tams. Um, as wide as you want, and then do the um, brim of the hat. And so you can knit a gaugeless hat and have it fit and know it's gonna fit because you can knit it to size, but um, yeah. I do that with Tams a lot. Tams are my favorite kind of hat to knit, by the way. I love Tams. I love wearing Tams. I love knitting them. I just think that they're so much more interesting than just a beanie because, you know, you start off with the band and then you do a quick increase to flare it out. I And it's just a very interesting type of hat to knit. And they're so pretty, like there's so many pretty things that you can do with color work and everything. I don't have it near me, do I? No, I don't. I wish I did. Um, if you go on my Instagram though, there's a hat that I call the reversible taxi hat that I did. And that was a combination of double knitting and linen stitch. And it's a tam and it's just, I think it's really pretty. Anyway. Um, so I'm sorry guys, I'm struggling a little bit today, <laughs> staying focused. Um, I did not come in today with a really good plan um, because everything I plan to do has just sort of gone out the window this weekend, but I didn't want to miss out on a live stream too. So what I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about, and part of the reason I even brought out this tunic pattern was I thought this was a really good example of using stitch markers and waste yarn for um, doing, being progress trackers. <laughs> yeah. I was in a really interest, another really interesting conversation this week that happened on Twitter and I blogged about it. If you check out my blog, I put up a new blog post yesterday at knitsworthat.com. And side note, I'm going to try, we'll see how successful, I'm going to try to regularly update my blog on Wednesdays, but we'll see if I can actually accomplish that. Anyway, um, but I had a blog post up yesterday where I talked about my hard drive fail and I talked about the comfort 
of low tech notions. And by that I meant low tech knitting notions. I know that I've been asked a couple of different times during live stream about what knitting or software that I might use for design or what have you. And I've always said that I don't really use um, my computer for knitting. Uh, <laughs> except maybe at the end after I finish a project, I'm like, I really should type up some clean notes from what I've just done. Because if you looked at my notebook, my notebook is a disaster. Um, but I've always, when it comes to knitting, have been very analog. I don't use applications for row tracking. I don't use applications to store patterns. When I do work from a pattern, I actually like having the printout and a piece of, and a pencil to mark things and write notes to myself. Um, I'm the same way with cooking. With cooking, if I find a recipe on the internet that I want to do, I print it out. I just find it easier to read those sorts of instructions off of a piece of paper than I do off of a screen. So I generally don't have my knitting on my computer, um, except for storing PDFs and such, because you know you have to have some. <laughs> this is the 21st century. You can't be totally computer free. But when it comes to notions, I'm very basic. And I just mean very like simple. <laughs> don't mean like basic, like as an insult. I just mean that I like to keep it simple. And I tweeted about how I personally have never understood the appeal of the stitch markers and progress trackers that are the little charms um, that either are hanging off of a ring or a lobster claw. I've now seen some where they're now putting them on um, earring ring clasps. Yes, that's correct. They're rings clasps that are for earrings. And I've never really understood the appeal of it. I get the appeal of it in the sense of the charms are adorable. And so the idea of having a cute little charm hanging off of your work is like really appealing. But I've always sat there and looked at the little charms and I'm like, oh, they seem like they're kind of weighty. And I don't want to add weight to my yarns, especially because I tend to work in finer yarns. And my other thing is just, it's always been like, I have always felt like they would be in the way, that the little charms would be in the way. So the aesthetic enjoyment of the charms was just never enough appeal to me. And as a matter of practicality, I really just prefer bulb pins, which are coilless safety pins. And let me just, right here, hanging off my work. These are bulb pins right here. I'll have to zoom in. And I did a video early on. One of my first videos was tracking shaping rows using stitch markers. So I use these as stitch markers along here. And these stitch markers were just placed to count my rows. And I would just place a stitch marker every um, fourth, every eighth, basically. Well, no. I had 44 rows of garter. So I placed these every four rows. So, um, so it was, yeah. And then up here, what I'm doing now, I'm started my shaping rows. And I've done two decrease rows and I'm decreasing on this pattern every sixth row. So I just did a decrease row. When I get to my next decrease row, after I finish it, I have these safety pins hanging off of here. And when I get to a decrease row, I just take off one of these pins and I mark that row. And then when I finish, there are no more pins left, I will know that I have done five shaping rows. And that way I can keep track of how many decrease rows I've done. I have a total of um, 20 decrease rows that I'm doing on this pattern. And so I'm just doing it where like I do five dangling little pins at a time. Um, but yeah, that's how I keep track of shaping rows with stitch markers. The other thing I love to do is with waste yarn, use that as stitch markers along a row. So um, to make sure I don't forget, zoom out a little bit. 
come on, Oop, that's zooming in, there we go. So to zoom out, what I do is I have my waste yarn here and here to mark out this center panel, and each row, this waste yarn is basically hanging off of the running thread that connects two stitches, and each row that I complete, I just flip, I'll knit across here, and then when I get, I'll flip this to the other side, and just flip this back and forth as I knit. Hey, Natalia, welcome. So glad you could make it. So yeah, I use just waste yarn. And what I love about using waste yarn like this to mark out a pattern repeat is the fact that, there we go. What I love about using waste yarn to mark a pattern repeat is I don't have to have a stitch marker dangling off my needle that I'm always slipping, but also that invariably falls off my needle. <laughs> like this waste yarn in the project itself is not going to just fall off my needle and go missing while I'm knitting, um, which that happens. It's all just very nice and secure, and this will all stay in place. So when I put this project down because I'm gonna go work on something else and maybe I get distracted and I haven't worked on this again for another week or two, <laughs> everything is attached. Everything is safe on the project itself. So because I've marked everything with um, bolt pins and waste yarn, that is all gonna stay put. When I come back to the project, I can very quickly figure out where I am in it again. The other thing I do here, you might be wondering, well, what is this pin right here? This is marking out the vertical repeat of the pattern. This is a 12 row um, vertical repeat. So this is the first repeat. So I just put a pin here to mark that. And then on this side, I have this, these pins here, and these pins are tracking my rows overall. So um, the, I'm putting a pin on the right side every 10th row, so I know, okay, this is 10 rows. So this is how I do my row tracking without any kind of row counter or, and I hate, oh my gosh, I don't love in terms of keeping track of rows and shaping rows. Like I don't like doing hash marks because I feel like paper, I'm gonna lose paper, right? Um, <laughs> or maybe I sit down in it and I don't have a pen or a pencil nearby and I hate, I just hate once I sit down to start knitting to have to get up to grab a pen or um, so I can do hash marks. So I never have enjoyed using like the hash mark method that's me personally. Everyone's got to find the method that works for them. I don't like having extra gadgets that are unnecessary that, again, I can lose or forget to use as I'm knitting. And I've just always found that using stitch markers for progress tracking has always just worked really well for me um, and having everything in my work. So it's just all nice and contained. So, And the bulb stitch markers are my favorite stitch markers. I did a video very early on um, showing off everything that was in my notions bag. And I know when I shot the video, I spent an inordinate amount of time discussing my stitch markers. <laughs> I have very strong feelings about my stitch markers. There, my couch loves to eat my little bulb stitch markers when I accidentally drop one. Yes, yes. It's so true. Um, my bulb stitch markers, like they go flying, but here's the great thing about the bulb stitch markers. Oh darn, I'm all tangled up in my cables. I don't know why I'm always so tangled up in cables. Um, fix that later. <sighs> Ever, that's funny. I just decided one minute before that you said you don't like hash marks that I realized they weren't working for me. Yeah. Um, I have two tins of stitch markers. Um, just get the right camera. Here we go. No, not the one I wanted. This, no, not the one I wanted. Oh, that's the one I wanted. Okay, so I have these two tins of stitch markers here, like this. Um, <laughs> and 
These are my two. Oh, I got to zoom out again. There we go. There we go. These are my two tins. These are all my bulb pins, my little tiny bulb pins. I was actually first introduced to these when I was learning about doing um, Japanese short rows, and I fell in love. The only thing is sometimes with chunkier yarns or bigger needles, these don't work as well. So that's why I have love my plastic interlocking stitch markers. These are the ones from Clover, which they are my favorite. I like the Clover ones best because, do I have one? Yes, I do. This one is a free stitch marker that came with like um, a set of interchangeable knitting needles. And the they work, I mean, they work fine, but the plastic is just thicker and so they, they're a little harder to close. Whereas with the Clover ones, the thickness of the plastic is just right. So like they're just easier to open and close. So these are my favorite and I need to get more because if you look in my tin here, this one, move that to the side. If you look in this tin, you would think my favorite stitch marker are these ring stitch markers because there's so many of them in here. But no, there's so many of these ring stitch markers because I never use them. <laughs> Whereas I always am using these stitch markers, and so I'm always losing these stitch markers. So um, these I'm constantly having to repurchase. But you can get like a thousand of this style of bulb pins, like a thousand of them for $10. And my couch has to eat a lot of bulb pins before I get another set of those, but I love them. Yes. Whitney, I agree. I think the clovers are like the best ones. Um, yeah. And if you go to my blog, I do have affiliate links to these things because <laughs> I have to pay for a hard drive. So I have to shill these affiliate links. Um, I also have pretty sure I have a Amazon affiliate link in the description box here. It's for interchangeable needles, but you can do a search for bulb pin and the Clover interlocking pin uh, plastic things if you want to get those, um, if you need to buy them. And yes, that can help support my channel at the same time. I feel like a schmuck shilling these affiliate links, but I'm being honest about it. I'm being honest about it. Oh my God, the coffee's so good this morning. Oh God. Natalia, I haven't even thought of using bulb pins as stitch markers. I have a few from clothes labels. Yes. A lot of stores now are starting to use those bulb pins um, for their price tags and everything and keep them and use them as your stitch markers. They're great. Um, the, the one limitation with them, because they tend to be smaller, although they're I believe I have seen extra large bulb pins as well, if you like the metal ones. The only thing is, um, one thing that I do like to do, I'll grab, oh God, you wanna see one of the most ridiculous stitch markers I ever bought? Don't buy these, do not buy these. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but it wasn't. And that's this. The idea of this, it's just an interlocking stitch marker but it seems so cool because it has this clip here, right? That you're theoretically supposed to put paper into, right? So that seems like a good idea, right? Put a little piece of paper in here. Brilliant. The piece of paper never stays. I've never once had a piece of paper stay, but you know who had a really good idea in terms of if you want to attach a piece of paper to your work with a note was Louise Tilbrook, who she's so sweet. Um, she, uh, we're mutual follows on Twitter, but she suggested actually using a bulb pen because you can just pierce the bulb pen into the piece of paper and then attach, which is basically what the idea of this is, only it doesn't work. So do not buy these. They weren't expensive, but it's still something that is completely useless. I got to find something to do with them. I just don't know what because their intended purpose does not work the way they think it does. Bear. I found some rainbow colored metal ball pens. Ooh, I like to use a little color code in my head for what? Yes. For example, green one is the start of a row. Red. That's great. That is a great tip, Bear. Okay, now I want to buy. Out. I want to go out and buy rainbow ball pens because I think that's a genius to color code it that way. That's really smart. I love using color coding. 
Oh, but what was I going to say? The one limitation with the little bulb pens is like with the interlocking stitch markers, when I'm casting on, you know, we all do it, cast on, and here's it. Oh, I'll just use this. You know, you just hang it here to mark off each repeat as you're casting on your stitches every 10, 20. So then you're not having to recount the stitches every time. It's just 10, 20, 30. It's really easy to do with these interlock, these plastic interlocking stitch markers to do that because they're sizable enough. But with the metal bulb pins, sometimes they're too small for the needle that you're using to effectively do that. Like this is, I believe, a size five needle. So this is going to fit just fine. Is that? There we go. I should turn on my overcan. You can see, there we go. You can see that. That's going to fit just fine on it. But if you get into like a size 10, 11, it's not going to work. So I like having both the plastic interlocking stitch markers from Clover and the metal bowl pins. It's like I got everything I need with that. And then of course, my scrap yarn. Love my scrap yarn. <laughs> oh, Natalia, oh, that's perfect. I know, it's genius. That's one of the fun things about live stream, right? Is we get to have these conversations and we all get to learn from each other. And I love that. I love that because I don't know everything. I just act like I do. Claudia, I love my charm like stitch markers, but knowing I can get bulb pins so people is making me rethink them. Yeah, it's true. You can get the bulb pins. They're so inexpensive. and. You know, I look at the charm ones, everyone, you gotta, you gotta do what works for you. And if the bulb, if the little charm uh, stitch markers or progress trackers make you happy, bring you joy, bring more joy to your knitting, go, I'm like all for it, you know. Um, I, but because of the way that I use stitch markers, like you can see from my work, I use a lot of stitch markers as I'm doing because there's so much I'm tracking with them that it's not financially feasible <laughs> to have the number of stitch markers that I need for a large project because I see people and it's like they'll have like one little progress tracker um, hanging off their project. I'm like, that's so cute. I've got like, I mean, let's look at this for a second. I mean, look at how many stitch markers. Oops. Sorry. There we go. Look how many stitch markers. And this is just for the first 44 rows. And that's because I was, you know, I was placing a stitch marker every fourth row so that I could keep track of this, how many rows I was counting. But the other thing, this is, I need to probably just do a whole video. I probably should do a whole dedicated video on all of the ways that I can use stitch markers to all the ways I can use stitch markers because there's a lot you can do with stitch markers that um, are very handy. A big one has to do with casting on in the round and that's actually the video I want to do. Um, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll shoot that on Monday because um, you know, one of the big challenges knitting in the round is always how do you join your work into the round without getting the stitches twisted and ending up with a, I'm not going to call it a Mobius because it's not, and I will get into that in a second, but without getting a 180 degree corkscrew into your work. And there is a way of using stitch markers or scrap yarn, you can do it with either, that will prevent you from ever twisting those stitches again when joining in the round. And I think that will probably be the next video that I shoot. I have to re-edit my last video because our drive fail. Ah. I made a few charm markers. They work for heavier yarn. Yeah, and that's what I saw when we were having the conversation on Twitter about um, stitch markers and the charmed ones. I was expecting a lot more people to come in to defend them, frankly, um, with that tweet. And most people, the thing I saw was like they were better for heavier yarns and also they work better in crochet. And that made sense to me because crochet is a stiffer fabric 
tends to be a stiffer fabric than what you have with knitting. And so I was like, okay, the weight of those charms with crochet isn't going to be as problematic as it can be with knitting. So, um, yeah, but I don't get me wrong. Some of those stitch markers are adorable. Like I go on Etsy and I see some of them and I'm like, I just kind of want one cause they're cute. Um, and then I'm like, Carrie, that's not practical. Don't do it. But like I always say, if it brings you joy, if it makes your knitting more happy, then, you know, use the tools that make sense for you, that work for you. And this is all, when it comes to stitch markers, which ones you like, which ones you don't like, that's all a matter of personal preference. It really is. It's, there's no one right tool to use. But you know, it's interesting. I did learn something through that whole conversation about stitch markers. And who knew I could go on for 30 minutes about stitch markers? I know I'm that person. I am a geek. I can talk 30 minutes about stitch markers. That's why I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> because I wanted to find the people who wanted to talk with me for 30 minutes about stitch markers. But anyway, um, I lost my train of thought. What was I gonna say? Oh, I learned something new from that whole conversation on Twitter about stitch markers and the ones with the charms. And people are, somebody came on and asked, do you mean progress trackers? And I was like, what's a progress tracker? How is that different from a stitch marker? Stitch marker. And um, they're like, well, a progress tracker you use basically to track your progress by placing them in various rows or to mark out, you know, shaping rows, what have you. And the stitch markers you use to mark a particular stitch or a repeat. And I was like, oh, okay. So yes, I'm using stitch markers as progress trackers. And it seemed to me you're using the same tools. You're just calling it. It was interesting to me in that it seemed like it was really, you're talking about the same tool, right? Bulb pins, the lobster claw pins, the ring markers. They're all the same tools. It's just, how are you using that tool? Um, so I thought, anyway, I learned a new term, progress tracker. And now I feel like I have to always say stitch marker slash progress tracker, but I don't because that's a lot. That's a mouthful. And I don't feel like saying that all the time. So I'm just going to say stitch marker and that's going to be stitch marker and progress tracker. So yes, I, Natalia, they are definitely more practical for crochet. Yeah. In my opinion. Bear. I like how fun the charm ones are, but don't like the thought of them pulling on a stitch. Yes, that has always been kind of my hesitation with using them. Also, when I first started knitting, those charm stitch markers, you really only saw in rings. And that to me wasn't practical because I like to use stitch markers by actually putting it on a stitch more than just hanging it off of my needle. That's always been a thing with me. And, um, Now you're seeing the charm stitch markers being put on lobster claws and ring clasps, which I think on the one hand is really clever. I feel like the ring clasp makes more sense to me, especially because I can then wear them as earrings if I want to instead, which I love that idea because they are adorable. But the lobster claw clasps, I just think about that little lever. And besides, dexterity I don't have dexterity issue I'm just thinking of people who might have dexterity issues those lobster claw class can be a little a little tricky I know when I do uh jewelry work I like to avoid lobster claw class they're not my favorite generally it's a whole other thing but um the other thing is I worry about the little lever on the lobster claw class getting snagged in the fiber or just rubbing against it and maybe I'm overthinking it quite possible. I mean, I am a person who can spend 30 minutes talking about stitch markers. I might overthink a few things. <laughs> but anyway, oh, one last thing, I think, let me know if you have any questions because we're getting near the end of our time together for this Sunday, Knit Tea Live. I'm gonna have to go through my whole long spiel. You know the one I'm talking about, it's coming. Get excited, the spiel is coming. But um, 
so let me know if you have any last minute questions for me before we wrap things up. But I just wanted to quickly, quickly talk about, because it came up and I just, little rant gripe for me. Twisting stitches when you join them in the round. <laughs> Sometimes people want to pretend that when they have joined in the round and the stitches have gotten twisted, that they can then call that a Mobius scarf or a Mobius what have you. It is not. If you choose to leave the twist because you like it or because you don't feel like ripping out the work and starting over again, that is a choice you are free to make, but just don't try to call it, because here's the thing. Mobius, a Mobius strip is a specific thing in the world. A Mobius is created by creating a 90 degree twist in a strip. And what that does, it's kind of amazing. It's kind of magical. It creates a what's called an unbound edge, meaning there's one continuous edge. If you draw your finger around the edge, you're going to go all the way around the project and end up at the same spot. There's not two edges. Um, if you do twist your stitches when joining in the round, that is a 180 degree twist that you produce and you have two edges to the work. So it's not a Mobius, it's more of a corkscrew. If you wanna keep that corkscrew in your work because you like it or you don't feel like going back, that's fine. That is your choice. You are the boss of your knitting. But let's not call it a Mobius because you know, Cat Forty, she, she did a, an amazing thing coming up with Mobius knitting for all of us. So let's just honor that tradition and call a Mobius what is a Mobius and not call a Mobius what is not a Mobius. <laughs> so anyway, that's my little rant for this evening afternoon. It's not evening yet. Well, it's evening somewhere in the world, just not here where I am in Los Angeles. So anyway, all right. So if no more questions, we're going to wrap things up for the day because uh, I need to elevate my ankle. <laughs> uh, pray for me this weekend, this week. Uh, I have to re-edit a video. I'm going to shoot a new video. So Friday's video, I should have a video on Friday, barring any more technological fails. That video is going to be about the mysterious world of the upside down stitches. Ooh. Um, if you want to find out what I'm talking about, keep an eye out for that video. Ever. Hope your ankle feels better soon. Thank you, Ever. It will. It's just going to take a few weeks to heal. And I'm just bummed out about it because I, I'm just bummed out about it. I hate when I sprain my ankle. And it's been three, I'm just bummed about it, but it'll be fine. It's a hard, the, the hardest thing, the hardest thing about the ankle is that I have a three-year-old daughter who's very active and it's like, she wants me to pick her up. And I'm literally like, I cannot pick you up like on the floor right now because I, I can't put that kind of weight on my ankle. <laughs> so it's just really hard. Whitney and hope you have a better week. Thank you. Thank you. So on Friday, I'm going to talk about the mysterious world of the upside down stitches. Ooh. So um, keep an eye out for that video. I have a new blog post up. Please check it out. I talk about what it was like <laughs> uh, with the hard drive. I talk about uh, what we talked about today with the notion, but I do have affiliate links to bulb pins and clover pins and a couple of other notions that I really like. Um, so if you want to help me out, you're interested in bulb pins anyway, you can find that affiliate link and help pay for my hard drive. Um, yes, I feel like a shell. What else? Okay. As, oh, and as always, if you are not already, please subscribe to my newsletter. There, you would, if you visit my website, knitswhereitsat.com, a form will pop up for the newsletter. So please sign up for that. I'm really trying to get that newsletter together, get that as part of my routine. Also, don't forget the Fiber Happenings updates on Mondays and Fridays. So you always want to check out my website to see what new pattern releases I've found or have been sent to me, what sales are upcoming on various websites. Um, 
Some of it is affiliate links, some of it is not. I do talk about sales that I see from various sources, not just places where I have affiliate links. So, you know, I'm not like that person. Um, also keep an eye on the Fiber Indie list. I have a new section. Oh, I almost forgot to mention. I have a new section to the Fiber Indie list, which is Yarny list. Um, this is for the spinners and dyers of the internet. I'm hoping to collect more people onto that list, um, but I do have somebody there. So new section to Fiber Indie list, which is the Yarny list. Check that out. Um, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and if you have not already, please hit subscribe and the notification bell. I do this because in my edited videos, little graphics pop up, but anyway, subscribe, imagine a subscribe graphic here, hit the notification bell, imagine a notification bell graphic here. <laughs> Hitting the notification bell will send you alerts to your email whenever I upload a new video or start a live stream. Uh, live streams, Knit Tea Live happens every Sunday at this time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. I hope, I hope as always, that you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. I hope you have a great week, that you have some great knitting or whatever craft that you're working on at the time happening for you. And as always, happy health. Wait, oh, it was a fun chat with everyone. Oh, good. I'm glad it was fun. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I got through my whole spiel. I think I did. Anyway, thank you everybody for joining me. And as always, happy health and happy knitting. Bye.